Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Tom Woods Show. This is episode 2489, and I'm delighted to welcome, I think, back Ben O'Neill. I've been, I think, an awful long time ago. I actually had you on The Tom Woods Show. Uh, Ben has had what we might think of as a rather hybrid career uh, in and out of academia. He's a professional statistician and economist. He's taught at uh, Australia National University, University of New South Wales. Uh, he does statistical and economic consulting uh, as of right now. And he's got some, he's done some very interesting work in particular on the subject of anti-discrimination law and the whole culture of uh, anti-discrimination. I'm going to link in the video description, as well as at tomwoods.com slash 2489 to his Google Scholar page, and you'll be able to uh, find some links there. But Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. It has been a long time. Now, we've got, yes, I, I didn't even go back to look, but it is quite, quite some time. Now, obviously, most Ameri- most people listening to this program are American, but I would say about, uh, it's something like 17 to 20% are from other countries, and so maybe a handful even in Australia. But most of us know the history of uh, anti-discrimination law in the United States and that the the big, big piece of legislation was the 19 civil, uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act. I don't actually know what the history of anti-discrimination in Australia is. Did it occur at roughly the same time, and does it consist of roughly the same rules? Um, there's a little bit of a lag, um, but you're only talking about a lag of probably a decade. Um, in Australia, um, anti-discrimination law was brought in in a set of bills um, targeting different things. We have a Racial Discrimination Act, Sex Discrimination Act, um, various other acts have been brought in uh, at different times, and these did lag uh, the US a little bit. Um, in Australia, there was also a constitutional referendum uh, with respect to the constitutional status of Indigenous people uh, in our country that occurred um, at around the same time as the civil rights era um, in the US. Um, so the th- things had happened probably roughly at the same time, but I'd say with a little bit of a lag, probably following US trends, it's fair to say. Okay. Well, I, I was just curious about that. Now, this is, I mean, there's so many third rails of American politics. You know, there's... Um, there's Social Security and Medicare, and whether whether you should try to do something about that coming fiscal train wreck, or there's the relationship between the United States and Israel. That's v- very hard to discuss that without everybody going berserk. But anti-discrimination law may trump all of them because this is the sort of thing everybody knows is is uh, like all right-thinking people know is a good thing. Some of them may be opposed to affirmative action but they favor anti-discrimination law. So, Yeah, and in, I, I guess this is where a loudmouth lunatic like me who will say anything comes in. Um, yeah, uh, right, this know, is this why is, <laughs> I'm very happy to invite you on. Because for one thing, I don't think you really can, conceptually, you really can separate anti-discrimination law from affirmative action. Because how are we yeah, going well, to know well, if you're not discriminating, given that we... We can't read your mind. The only thing we can do is look at the demographic makeup of your workforce. So therefore, you have to engage in affirmative action. Well, this gets into quite interesting territory. My interest in this, actually, I'm probably a little bit unique in that my main interest in this is not really from a moral or political standpoint, although that is interesting. My main interest in this topic is as a statistician and someone who's an expert at essentially statistical inference and uh, which is essentially the science of how we make decisions inferring the unknown from the known. Uh, and this bears very heavily on discrimination problems. I sometimes say that statistical science is the science of discrimination. So actually my interest in this topic is more around the kind of statistical dynamics. Um, but the the issue you raise is a very interesting one. I think the prevailing um, theory of discrimination that's, that's so ubiquitous in our society, what I've called in my writing the anti-discrimination paradigm or what's sometimes called the progressive theory of discrimination, um, is this view that in the absence of uh, adverse, unfair, unscientific discrimination against people, um, that you would get essentially proportionate equality of outcome in social processes. 
Um, and then when people don't see that as the outcome that occurs, um, the next step is to say that, well, there must be some additional discrimination going on that we can't detect if the outcomes are unequal in a proportionate sense. Uh, and therefore, the entire essentially apparatus of anti-discrimination law becomes this apparatus of detecting inequality of outcome through statistical methods. And then if that is detected within appropriate statistical tolerances, um, saying that discrimination must have occurred uh, and possibly imposing some kind of positive discrimination or affirmative action as a alleged corrective to that. Right. Now, <clears throat> I, I noted that uh, you uh, some years ago uh, reviewed a book by Thomas Sowell on discrimination and disparities. And his work on this is is tremendous and, the, and, and, and is very complementary to your own because your own, in some cases, might be viewed as, not that there's anything wrong with this, but theoretical. And he has got all these empirical examples of statistical disparities that we can obviously tell have no sinister origin. I mean, the fact, for example, that I believe men are something like eight times as likely as women to be struck by lightning. Now, that doesn't mean that lightning is seeking men out. You know, we, we instantly know that, that that would be preposterous. But yet, given that the, the reigning assumption, as you say, is that if disparities exist, the, the automatic, the initial automatic conclusion is that it has some sinister motive. It's, it, it's caused by, quote unquote, racism. Um, and, and the benefit of somebody like, like Soul is to come along and, and show in the real world where a lot of times if you correct, even if you simply correct for uh, differences between populations, if you correct for education and age and whatever, you find that the alleged disparities actually disappear. Yeah, well, the wonderful thing about the example you just gave, which Sol uses in his works, is obviously lightning being a natural phenomenon is not making any conscious decisions at all. So if this is a, a, an instance where um, outcomes differ systematically across demographic groups, which they do, and the empirical evidence shows that, and discrimination is literally impossible when you're talking about a natural phenomenon that doesn't reason, um, then it does act as a, a very strong falsifying mechanism to that theory. But I, I think where that confusion comes from, I think generally speaking, people who aren't trained in statistics, I suppose, have often a fairly poor understanding of the relationship between correlation and cause. Um, correlation meaning simply the empirical tendency of things to go together or not go together, and cause obviously being cause, which I'm sure your listeners are familiar with. Um, one of the things we learn in scientific education is this very um, commonly referred to uh, principle that correlation does not imply cause. Many many of your listeners have probably heard this saying that correlation doesn't imply cause. It's something we drum into science students at the universities. Um, and what we're trying to tell them is that the mere fact that two things go together doesn't necessarily mean that one is the cause of the other. And this is something that, you know, really any scientifically literate person learns. What is less appreciated, which is an equivalently true principle, is the contrapositive of that which is that the absence of cause does not imply the absence of correlation. So if there is an absence of, say, discrimination causing uh, differences in outcome, that does not imply that there would be no differences in outcome. Um, and I think it's, it's a, a failure to appreciate the kind of contrapositive of that scientific principle that leads people to this um, intuitive but wrong view that in the absence of demographic discrimination, uh, we would expect to get social process outcomes uh, that are proportionate essentially to people's numbers in the host population. Yeah. In effect, I would be willing to guess that that's probably never occurred anywhere uh, for, for any measure because of all the differences that, that exist. In fact, um, Seoul has an older book called Civil Rights, Rhetoric or Reality that's I suppose probably an earlier version in a way of the, the uh, discrimination and disparities book that I think brings the argument up to date. But in there, he is uh, very much at pains to to demonstrate this point that that uh, it was something like Polish Americans are 25 years older on average than Puerto Ricans. Well, that alone means you will never, ever get the same uh, numbers out of them because 
You've had 25 extra years to build up your net worth. You have more education. You've, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons um, you could be doing better in, uh, you know, in terms of financial success and, and what have you. But you go down the line, and it's not just um, statistics like that. It's, it's things like, um, at least at the time of publication, uh, Mexican-American women, half of them uh, were married by age 18. But only 10% of Japanese American women were married by age 18. Do you think that might affect, first of all, it'll affect uh, almost certainly the age at which they have children. Do you think that might affect how much they're in the workforce, how much they earn? These things are everywhere. And so to think that you're just going to get, well, we have 10% X in the population, so there'll be 10% X in every occupation is, to say the least, not reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, the kinds of empirical examples Sowell uh, gives that you've just mentioned um, are really good illustrations of that. I sometimes tell my students when I'm teaching them, and this is only a slight, uh, this is a slight exaggeration, but only, only slightly, I tell them everything is correlated with everything. Um, meaning effectively, um, that as you say, you know, race is correlated with age of marriage, which is correlated with, with wealth, which is correlated with health, which is correlated with everything, you know. Um, certainly the absence of correlation in these social process outcomes is the exception rather than the rule. It will tend to occur either very, very rarely by coincidence or um, when someone actually intervenes with affirmative action to force equality of outcome. And that, that's about the only time you see it. So I, th I think you're certainly right that that is the exception rather than the rule. All right, now let's get into the stuff that Ben O'Neill says fearlessly in his published work. Uh, to my great surprise, by the way, in the Independent Review, uh, I'm I'm impressed and and somewhat shocked that some of this got in there. So you have an article um, called "The Anti Discrimination Paradigm: Irrational, Unjust, and Tyrannical," and relatively early on, you talk about uh, statistical inference and quote unquote discrimination. So I hereby, and perhaps the, I'm sure that taxi driver example is still valid today. So I invite you to share what your argument is there. Sure. Um, so this goes back to some economic research that started in about the 60s and 70s on a phenomenon called um, statistical discrimination, sometimes called rational discrimination. Essentially how this works is um, suppose that we encounter a person that we don't know very much about. Um, in some context, and there's various characteristics of theirs that would be uh, of relevance to some decision we have to make um, to them. So, for example, the, the example I give in the paper, or one of them, um, is an example from the 1980s um, where a, a group of uh, scholars did an a empirical analysis of the behavior of taxi drivers um, in Los Angeles in the 1980s, and they found that uh, taxi drivers were less likely uh, to pick up young black males as fares, um, and they investigated uh, into this. In that kind of situation, you have a, a problem with very limited information. The taxi driver has to make a decision about whether or not to pick up a person based on a, a very small amount of information, just observing them very briefly, uh, in which they can really only pass that person's uh, race, sex, approximate age, you know, basic clothing and demeanor in a very short observation window. And they have to make a decision of whether this is a, a fare that is going to be a safe one to pick up or whether they're at risk of some kind of crime. Um, and one of the things that uh, statistical discrimination teaches us is that when there are what we might call merit characteristics here, say whether the person's going to beat you up or not, um, that are unknown to you, uh, statistical inference can be used to try to guess what those characteristics are from any other characteristic you can observe that is correlated with that. So if demographic characteristics like race, sex, age, etc. are correlated with, say, crime, uh, which we know empirically they are in 1980s Los Angeles, for example, um, then statistical inference tells us it is rational to discriminate on the basis of those characteristics as, effect as effectively proxies to try to guess the unknown characteristic of true interest. Um, and what's crucial there to understand is that that is rational irrespective of whether 
um, those demographic uh, characteristics have any causal impact on the thing of interest. So we need not believe that uh, bio- biology and race causes crime. We need we need not believe that um, you know, for example, a person is racially predisposed to crime or something like that. We need not, need not have any causal belief there. It's sufficient that those are correlated for any empirical reason, um, in which case it's valid uh, to use one as a predictor of the other in, in that kind of circumstance. Hey, folks, if you're a homeschooling parent, you're probably working too hard. The self-taught K-12 through Ron Paul curriculum to which I contributed hundreds of lessons on history and government is the answer. For one thing, your students will actually learn, get this, that there are two sides to the argument at a time when their peers don't even realize there is an argument. But in addition to the standard subjects, we also teach what the state's ideological prison camps should teach but don't, like how to run a home business, how to manage money, how to be an effective public speaker, and that's just for starters. Not to mention, if you sign up through my link, you get $160 worth of free bonuses that you won't get otherwise. So head over to my link, which is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Now, when you say valid, do you mean morally valid, like like the, well, the taxi driver? Well, I'm talking driver? here from the kind of validity of a, a kind of a statistical procedure as a, as a logically valid inference procedure. Um, I do go on in the paper, though, to argue that um, having established that that is the optimal logical way to behave and that this is a rational inference procedure, um, that it is also uh, valid, you know, morally valid. It's it's appropriate to view that as a morally valid action. It will be an action that tends to, on the taxi driver's end, minimize um, their risk and reduce um, their victimization um, against crime. It also um, creates some useful incentives at a collective level um, for groups to um, reinforce good values within within their own community to try to prevent people effectively to try to prevent people who look like them to from doing bad stuff so that it doesn't um, impact them negatively in a statistical discrimination sense and it has certain you know other aspects that uh, give it a good moral foundation but more generally I think a lot of you know the kind of theories of morality that I've I've found the most compelling are those that are built on the idea that we ought to act rationally in situations, that we ought to incorporate all available information, that we ought to try to make judgments of other people that are, you know, sensible, measured, rational judgments based on the information we have. And so in that sense, I I do argue that this is a morally valid thing to do in addition to a, a valid method of statistical inference. All right. Well, let, let's think about what some people might say in response to that. Uh, which I, I could imagine people saying, well, it's hard to imagine people saying this, but uh, let's say they were willing to meet you 80% of the way and saying, uh, obviously there is a connection. they're usually willing to meet me, Tom. So this is very generous. <laughs> well, I'm starting off with the easy ones. Okay. So let's say they're willing to concede. All right. Well, there obviously is some connection between these things. Uh, and And we understand that you're not claiming that it's a Uh, It's a necessary connection, but that all the same, there is a connection. Uh, But what does this mean for the average person who belongs to the race in question, who uh, is, you know, through no fault of his own, is now uh, being, in effect, kind of targeted for um, at least some kinds of mistreatment that he did nothing to deserve? And so on the individual level, this does seem like an injustice. I certainly think it's uh, something for which a person should have our sympathies, whether or not it's an injustice. I certainly think you're correct that in this instance, you will get people who, uh, through unchosen characteristics, say, um, can't get a taxi or are at least less likely to get a taxi. Um, I don't think you've necessarily looked at both sides of the ledger with that objection. One of the things that this study found was that black taxi drivers were just as likely to discriminate against young black males as white taxi drivers. So evidently, um, black male taxi drivers um, also felt safer engaging in this statistical discrimination process. And I think it's reasonable to expect that, uh, given that that inference method generally ought to be expected to work to some degree, um, that less taxi drivers probably got assaulted and robbed based on their rational statistical discrimination, and that would include less black 
male taxi drivers, for example, also being victimized. So there, there are two sides of the ledger here. Um, but I certainly do sympathize with a uh, young black male, for example, in 1980s Los Angeles, tries to flag a taxi and uh, is turned down. You know, it's, it's uh, certainly, you know, not an ideal outcome. One of the things I think that we can take some solstice in is um, the fact that if we have this kind of negative incentive, it does create some internal incentive within a community to say, okay, why is this happening to us? And ultimately, this is happening because of the bad guys who beat up taxi drivers, right? They're, they're ultimately the data, if you like, that leads to the adverse discrimination, right? So any young black male who has beaten up a taxi driver is the data on which uh, those taxi drivers are now avoiding that demographic group. So I think it does create then an incentive within that community to try to, you know, use their existing culture to reinforce um, some social pressure perhaps on others to, you know, behave better. One would hope that at least. And, one one uh, would hope that, but in, in what happens in reality uh, under a state is that uh, generally the, the, the state and its various hangers-on uh, instead pr- pr- uh, spread the idea that um, – there's absolutely no reason for those taxi drivers to make those decisions. And once again, you are purely a victim for no reason. And so then no, you know, no valuable progress gets made. No one talks about what needs to be talked about. Yeah, and I think that's true. But I mean, I guess that just then goes back to the the value of trying to teach people about the nature of rational statistical discrimination. I think if if the population at large understood this better, um, then I think there would be a greater uh, understanding of where the roots of these problems actually lie. I think discrimination itself often gets the blame for um, other forms of pathology that are the root cause of, you know, those kinds of situations which you're describing, which are, you know, situations that harm people and and for which they should have our sympathies. But I I don't think we necessarily uh, focus on the correct thing to try to fix in those circumstances. I'm curious, by the way, if, if there was ever a study uh, done about the likelihood, especially let's say late at night, that a taxi driver would pick up a man versus a woman of any race. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that particular study um, was that general, but I mean, in general, um, you know, men are a much more high risk group for crime. Yeah, than so women. I wonder if what um, kind of result and, you And that's get. been something, you know, that's something that obviously... You know, everyone is aware. I mean, all other things being equal, men are more higher risk than women. um, And males in, you know, young adulthood are probably in the highest risk category um, for, you know, criminal violence. So there is good empirical data. And I think people understand this, that the high risk categories are men, young men, and certain racial groups, depending on what particular country you're in. Um, People have, I think, a good sense, at least roughly, of, of where these high-risk groups are. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned men, sorry. I, I Just uh, apropos that topic, um, there was a little bit of a controversy went around, I think it would have been about a decade ago now. I, I remember this. Um, there was a guy who came around a bunch of US campuses um, giving a talk. I think it was called She Fears You. Um, and this caused a bit of a stir. This guy went around a bunch of campuses on the US and essentially counseled young men of the fact that when they're walking alone at night um, and they walk past women or they walk within the vicinity of women uh, at night, they should be aware of the fact that uh, women may fear them even though they're personally good guys, right? And this caused a little bit of a stir. Um, Some young men were very upset with the idea that even though they're personally a nice guy, um, that they would be feared and uh, treated as a potential predator. Um, I myself uh, at the time was, you know, a younger man and, and liked to walk at night. And I had this very experience. You have to, you know, be a bit careful when you're walking at night. If there's females around, you need to be aware that you are perceived as a potential threat to them. I think it's because I understood rational discrimination that I was never offended by that. I just understood that this is not a negative commentary on me personally. This is simply a consequence of that person having very limited information about me, knowing very little about me, and simply knowing that I am in a high-risk group and acting accordingly. 
Well, I'll, I'll be honest. When I was a little bit younger, and uh, if I would, you know, I didn't have facial hair, but if I would go without shaving for a while, and I would show up at the airport, I I would look suspicious. <laughs> I looked like I was up to something, and and I, I wouldn't say I, I got a lot of suspicious looks, but but I wouldn't say I got zero. But again, I I didn't think to myself, what a terrible injustice. I thought, well, I'm sorry that people like me keep causing problems. You know, I wish they'd stop. Then then I wouldn't have this issue. Yeah, I, I've had the, the uh, same experience, actually. Every time I go through an airport, I seem to be the guy that gets pulled up for a quote-unquote random uh, <laughs> random uh, bomb uh, chemical analysis and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, look, I, I'm probably, you know, it have, have been traveling at times where I am, you know, uh, military age male and, you know, in that, in that group. Uh, but look, it, it, it doesn't bother me um, simply because, again, I think having an awareness of statistical discrimination also gives you an awareness of the fact that, you know, you may, through no fault of your own, be in a high-risk group, um, which is a higher yield group for people searching or targeting for potential negative things. And it's not a commentary on you personally. Um, it's simply a product of limited information. Now, you in this particular article, as I said, I'm, I'm linking to Google Scholar, but I should probably link to this piece of view, this particular piece from the Independent Review. Uh, yeah, in that's which, probably a good one. Yeah, oh, I would say it is. It's it's very systematic. And, and uh, to, as it comes to a conclusion, you have the subheading, the injustice of the anti-discrimination paradigm. So I think a lot of libertarians would say that what's unjust about it is the coercion involved, but that's not the angle you're taking here, although I'm no doubt you object to the coercion involved. But but even if there weren't coercion involved, the, the idea that I'm supposed to have certain mental states and it's wrong of me to have other mental states is also part of the anti-discrimination paradigm. So what is, in fact, in your view, is unjust about it? Yeah, I think it's deeper than just the coercion, although, as you say, that is an aspect of um, of the injustice. You know, I think at a deeper level, the anti-discrimination paradigm that forms the kind of philosophical basis for, I suppose, our anti-discrimination law and, and more lately what we call wokeness, um, is it's built on a set of axioms that are false. One of those axioms is that all discrimination is wrong and and that is false simply because we do have this category of statistical discrimination that is actually uh, quite a rational thing to do. Another axiom of that paradigm is that in the absence of discrimination, whether rational or irrational, that outcomes would be proportionate across groups subject only to random statistical variation. That's also false, as we've discussed. And then finally, um, the third kind of thing that you see in this paradigm is that because they observe outcomes uh, which are not um, obeying that expectation, there's this belief that you need to engage in affirmative discrimination to equalize outcomes and that doing so is benign, that it doesn't lead to adverse consequences generally or lower, lower merit characteristics for the targeted groups. So all of this kind of manifests in a kind of um, feedback loop where, I mean, say I'm a believer in the anti-discrimination paradigm, right? What, what, what's going to happen is I'll say, okay, no one discriminate. And we try and stamp out discrimination. And let's say we do so largely successfully, like we make it verboten for people to express racist views in society. We make it, you know, a very strong culture of you know, don't discriminate, don't discriminate, don't discriminate. But yet we see there's still massive inequality of outcome in all sorts of social processes. So then what you see happen is, okay, well, we have to double down. We have to double down. We need to, you know, enforce this culturally harder and harder and harder and harder. And the answer is, if we're still getting inequality of outcome, there must be some hidden racism, sexism, et cetera there. And so you get this transition occurring from an initial um, advocacy that, okay, we need to get rid of, you know, overt sexism and racism. Then it's, oh, well, there's implicit sexism and racism. We need to get rid of that. And then you get all the way to, well, we can't see anything, so it must be structural. Like, in other words, completely unobservable, you know, uh, structural racism, meaning effectively that all we can see is disparities in outcomes. And that's enough for us to, to say that this is still happening. 
And you get this kind of um, psychosis forming, I suppose you could say, where you're getting more and more frustrated that the outcomes aren't equal. You know, your theory says that if you get rid of the discrimination, the outcomes should equalize and you're, you're pushing hard and you're, you know, beating people to death with this culture and it still doesn't happen. Well, at a certain point, I think this is where you see these kinds of pathologies arising, these kinds of um, overt hatreds for groups that are getting better outcomes in the social processes, this kind of uh, overt disparagement of groups that are getting better outcomes in those social processes, um, direct um, intervention in terms of affirmative action and discrimination against those groups, um, differential standards of um, behavior and so on expected of different groups. And you start to see this kind of thing arise and it leads to all sorts of these pathologies, including, you know, uh, the re-arising of racist ideas and things like this. So th I think there's a lot of injustice there in a cultural sense, far beyond just the coercion. And I think this essentially comes as a kind of reductio ad absurdum of a set of false principles that are widely adopted. Folks, in this day and age, there are a lot of competing demands for your time, and a lot of them are a complete waste of your time. Well, I have an excellent way to deal with it all. With the Blinkist app, you can absorb huge amounts of information in 27 nonfiction categories like history, philosophy, parenting, career, technology, and religion. And Blinkist takes each of these books and condenses it into a 15-minute summary you can read or listen to. So that means if you have a half-hour commute each way, you can be absorbing the equivalent of four books. You think that might make you a more impressive person? And one way you know the folks at Blinkist are pretty good people is that unlike virtually any other service, among the thousands and thousands of titles you'll find at Blinkist, you'll also find libertarian classics by Murray Rothbard, Milton Friedman, and dare I say, even your own host here. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 40% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash woods to get 40% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. We see this kind of um, thinking in in other other paradigms, like, for example, Keynesianism. If, if there's an attempt at fiscal stimulus of an economy, and it doesn't seem to do anything and things get worse, the presumption is never, well, maybe our whole approach to this is wrong. Maybe our whole, the way we're conceptualizing the problem is wrong. It's, we didn't do enough. And then they keep doing it, and it's, it's never enough. Or um, you know, during the COVID stuff, well, everybody's wearing a mask. Well, that's, maybe that wasn't enough. So our, not enough people are wearing masks. It must be that there are some people who we can't see anywhere, but somewhere they're not wearing them, and we got to get tougher on them. So it, it never occurs to them to say, maybe this is not actually a useful mechanism to, you know, to, to get our desired outcome. It's we just haven't pushed it hard enough. And, and that, I think, is what's so sinister about, uh, you know, the calls for, quote, equality, which could mean anything and, in fact, has meant anything. And the general anything that it means is that the political regime can intervene in all kinds of aspects of life in order to bring about this elusive outcome. They never reach it. Uh, and, and they never reach it because there are a million possible reasons for them not to reach it. Um, when I think about, for example, the reason that there is a, a white black achievement gap in, uh, you know, in schools, like a f close to a four grade achievement gap. This is not because the schools are just discriminating against black students and they're just uh in, a, in a, a very hostile way, preventing them from getting the resources they need. That is absolutely not true. I mean, you look at virtually all school districts in America are run by progressives. They're run by the very people who, if anything was going to work, have tried that thing. They, they've basically tried every possible thing. And so the answer now is not that, well, whatever the explanation for this, it's beyond the ability of the schools to fix Maybe it's in the household. Who knows what the explanation is? 
the schools have done pretty much everything they can at this point. No, now it's that the 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 discrimination is so deep and profound and intense we can't even perceive it so now we have to somehow seem to we got to pull it out of our society bit by bit in uh even though we we can't perceive it immediately we'll have to like dig back and pull back layers and see what we can find and and it'll never occur to them well we've looked everywhere i guess it's not there. then it'll just be even deeper requiring further intervention into your life uh requiring further mad um government activity so i think that's the thing is that they they latch on to something and w- when it quote doesn't work it's always because they haven't applied enough of it yeah and i think this comes back to this being a kind of an axiomatic theory um which is treated as unfalsifiable i mean essentially um, the anti-discrimination paradigm treats its axioms as unfalsifiable. So when the observation is that uh, merits and outcomes are not equal across different demographic groups in social processes, instead of taking that ever as evidence um, that perhaps this assumption that they ought to be um, might not be correct, as you say, the assumption, or the, the conclusion rather, is always that um, discrimination and hostility against the low outcome groups is still present um, and hidden more than we thought it was and more subtle and more uh, perverse than we thought it was. And perhaps it's buried deep in the structure. You see a lot of the advocates of this kind of view um, have literally moved towards the point where they will say um, that, for example, racism no longer occur. That racism without racists is is a is a phrase they'll use. That this could be a thing where, without any individual ever having any kind of malicious thought or action, that simply the structure of society and institutions itself, um, in, in a kind of an abstract way, is sufficient. And so I think, yeah, you're you're talking about that lack of falsifiability. One thing I would say with what you just brought up, I'm not sure I agree entirely with it because I actually think the progressive educators that you're talking about have made things much worse. One of the perverse uh, aspects of this kind of thinking is that, for example, when you're talking about the students, you know, when you get inequality of outcomes uh, across race groups uh, within schools, you know, one of the things that these progressive educators have said is they've said, okay, um, The problem here is structural racism. And so in order to try to solve that, we're going to take um, present behavioral aspects of the groups that are lagging behind and treat their behavior as if it's not problematic at all and make sure they're, you know, we we won't hold them, for example, to standards of, you know, punctuality and so on. So you, you see these doctrines arising. You may have seen this um, that, that for example, punctuality is a form of whiteness and rigor is a form of whiteness and, uh, you know, all of these kinds of things that we would have think, think of as simply um, the methods by which you educate someone correctly and improve their circumstances, that those constitute harmful whiteness and their antipode is authentic blackness and therefore um, you won't teach a young black student how to think with rigor or how to be punctual or how to, you know, develop any of these aspects of executive functioning that, you know, would actually improve their education. So I actually think you end up, you know, perversely making these things worse. And, you know, sometimes the the result is that you take these groups who are already lagging behind and you just completely screw them over by giving them a uh, counterfeit education. Uh, going back to Sowell, Sowell actually in his autobiography talks about his own schooling um, at an exceptional school that produced, I think, not only Sowell, but I think a, a, a black chief justice and another one who became an admiral. And he talks about the kind of schooling that he was given. And it was essentially that kind of traditional schooling where he was held to a high standard. He, you know, there was certainly no... Um, aspect of any teacher saying, oh, well, you're black, so you don't have to comply with punctuality and you don't have to comply with rigor because those are whiteness. Um, so I think, you know, what you're talking about is, I think these progressive educators are really sabotaging people. 
I think that's that's a more recent phenomenon. I think that came along after their first attempts didn't work. So it, I yeah, think that, it does. That, that's probably fair. Yes. Yeah. So so I think it 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 conforms to what I said in the sense that. Uh, as time goes on, when the various efforts don't work, they have to come up with ever more wildly implausible explanations for neither, why they're not working. And, and as you say, one of them is, well, we can't hold them to these um, extraneous standards. But that would, I mean, my gosh, if, if, and and you know, and it's not, it's not like um, only black students are having this done to them, but they are the outstanding example because they have uniquely bad leadership. I, I mean, if 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 I were a black leader, I would be saying, OK, we're going to chuck all of this because all of it's an insult. Like what? I can't show up on time because I'm black. I mean, will you knock that off? I mean, if you don't expect certain results from people, then you're not you're probably not going to get them. But if you do expect them, you have a better chance of getting them. But really, at this point, yeah. white supremacy is it, it, it is, has been defined to include almost any just ordinary way somebody might act. And so, so now we're almost like at the end game of this because beyond that, where else can they go? They, they've already yeah, demonized well, every good quality. Where else can they go if right. this doesn't work? And I mean, this is why I say I consider a lot of this stuff to be essentially just the re reductio ad absurdum of a set of false assumptions. They are going to play out to their absurd, ridiculous conclusion until eventually it must either degenerate back into classical racism or implode completely. It's interesting you mentioned that, you know, this is not just uh, black students we're talking about and black people in general. Um, there's a great author, Theodore Dalrymple, um, is his pen name, but Anthony Daniels um, yeah. is his actual name. He has written a number of books about the white underclass in Britain. And you, if you read these, it's the exact same pathologies. It is the exact same outcomes. Um, so, you know, you, you find that this is not something that's kind of an inherently racial thing. It, it has one dynamic in the US, it has another dynamic in the UK, um, and, and completely different racial groups can suffer from these same adverse outcomes and uh, things like this under very similar cultural circumstances. So one of the kind of points that uh, Dalrymple makes is that uh, there's a great deal of parallel between uh, I suppose, the white underclass in the UK compared to, say, the black underclass in the US and, and a lot of the same problems and a lot of the same outcomes. Well, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to link to this particular article and your Google Scholar uh, link. I'll put that in the description of the video. Also, tomwoods.com slash 2489. Um, you know, since you are coming to uh, us from Australia, and since we're recording this uh, late morning where I am, um, I feel bad that it's pretty late where you are, but I appreciate how cooperative and, and friendly uh, you were about all this, and uh, I hope people check out your work. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.